Welcome to Playful Podcast, your guide into the underground scene where we discover topics on kink and electronic music every week. Don't forget to subscribe to not miss out on our next episode. We're excited to be here today with Shibari artist and rigger Marie Sauvage. In this episode, we speak about what this rope bondage actually is all about, what about it makes it an obsession for anyone trying it out, Marie's own journey and take on it, as well as the trust that's created between the rigor and the person tied up, and what being tied up can mean for your self-development, and so much more. Let's get to it. I am Amanda, and this is Playful Podcast. Okay, I'm so happy to have you here. It's so nice. How are you feeling? Good. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's so a big pleasure. All right, you've been in Berlin for a couple of days now. Yeah, about a week. About a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, everyone who knows Shibari knows you. It feels like at least in this city, and uh, yeah, the community isn't so big in Europe and the America, is it? I would say the Shibari community is really small. So I think everyone who's an enthusiast of rope knows everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. And for those who don't know Shibari, it's a uh, rope bondage. But like, how would you explain what it is and the purpose of it a little bit better? So Shibari is an aesthetic way of tying someone up. Uh, Historically, it was done for sexual purposes. um, And even before it was a kink, it was a way that samurais were capturing their prisoners. (laughs) And then it evolved into a kink. Um, Now it's become something very interesting because people practice shibari for various reasons. So either they do it purely for the art or they do it for meditation reasons or purely for trust building. Meditation reasons. Can you do it on yourself then? Yeah, there's a lot of people who self-bind. Oh, do you do that too? Yeah, I can self-bind. Yeah? And do you do that like to meditate more so? Or like how does it work for you when you do that? When I tie myself? Mm. Well, when I tie myself, I do it for central reasons because I like the way it feels. Okay, (laughs) yeah. Okay, um, but if we go back a little bit in time, who were you as a teenager and how was your upbringing, you say? Mm, my upbringing, my parents are hippies. So <laughs> I grew up in a very open-minded environment. Um, my father is a Sufi. And Sufi? Yes, he <laughs> he's been teaching and studying Sufism for 45 years. Mm-hmm. So I grew up in a non-religious household and my parents really love that I do Shibari and they're like, oh, that's really cool. It'll teach us more. So <laughs> mm-hmm. I've always had this very like open-minded environment to explore myself. Oh, so nice. I, I remember then the last time or like you have also been mentioning at some point that you were like interested in sexuality when you were younger or like intrigued by it, but maybe not so much in the heteronormative way. But like, um, how would you say that? How would you say that that kind of uh, uh, evolved when you discovered Shibari? Hmm. I, yeah, <laughs> it's a funny question because it's funny to say like, yeah, I was always obsessed with sex. Like, yeah, when I was a kid, I was like, what is going on with adults? Like, what are they doing? That's very interesting. Um, that, so I think my interest in sexuality, it just evolved naturally. It was very, it wasn't like an external thing or a person or partner who introduced me into it. It was just something that I was always seeking on my own and that I was curious about. And I just somehow managed to, when it really, when I really got into it, I was living in New York and I made a FetLife account <laughs> and there was someone who was really into the events there and they invited me to the events and I got to know the community and it just never stopped since then. Oh, so your introduction to BDSM was through something else than Shibari? Yeah. Yeah. It's not that I had a particular trauma or something, that an incident I could think about that made me want to explore an alternative lifestyle. 
But growing up, I've always been very acutely aware of power dynamics, particularly between men and women. And I think that heteronormative relationships as presented in a very vanilla, like small town. So I grew up between Manhattan and I went to high school in Montclair, New Jersey. So it was very small town minded. (laughs) Um, And I wasn't satisfied with that. And I was just so interested in the underlying power dynamics between men and women and like boys and girls and the sexism that's imposed, you know, especially like the the way that there's a double standard for women. And I just felt intuitively, I am a sexual being. Why am I not allowed to express that? Mm. I remember when I was really young, I was eight or nine and my mom wanted me to go to uh, church. And this was before my parents really got into Sufism because my mom is from the Caribbean and it's very Christian there. And I remember going to the church and I was like, you are all going to hell because you have sinned. And I'm like, I'm eight or nine years old. What have I done? Like I've done nothing. So if my natural state as a child is sinful, I will be sinful for the end of my days. It was like this really clear thought process. And I was like, I'm never going to church again. I don't care. I'm a heathen. I'm an atheist. Stop mom. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, very, so like, uh, it was very intense. Like, no, this is who I am. So I always knew I was this kind of person. Yeah. Always, like, have you always been then a very strong character, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know any, was there anyone who inspired you with that? Or was it just, you were born that way, kind of? I think the, I think my parents are pretty strong people. Mm-hmm. They're both political refugees, so mm. they, they work their way up in life. And I think maybe that was inspiring in some way. But yeah, yeah, must have been. Yeah. <laughs> okay, wow. Um, but uh, then you discovered Shibari. Was it on Burning Man the uh, first so time? This story is interesting because Burning Man was the aha moment. But it really started because I was working as a dominatrix in New York City and I had a friend who kept telling me um, there's no like professional mistresses who do shibari. Like there are mistresses who do bondage and metal bondage and all that, but not actual Japanese shibari. She said if there was a woman who was doing that, she would make a lot of bank. (laughs) This was nine years ago. And I was like, I don't want to do that. It looks complicated because I would go to all these parties and I'd see usually it was a man with a woman and they're showing off and it's all about their skills. And I just was like, I'm staying away from that world. I'm not interested. And she kept telling me to do it so when I went to Japan for the first time she said you're going to Japan Shibari comes from Japan just give it a try and I went to meet Hajime Kinoko who is the the master of Shibari I just googled like bondage Japan <laughs> it was like the first one who came up and I was like okay well it was the only also the only page in English and Japanese so he also was- amazing that you managed <laughs> to get a meeting with <laughs> Yeah, like smashing that. <laughs> it wasn't that easy. I was really persistent and he was really intimidating and scary at first. Mm. Intentionally. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It's supposed to be, no? Yeah, but it was very cinematic meeting him. Mm. Um, so I met him. I took a class with him. And then my best friend in New York told me um, he's going to be doing a performance at Burning Man. She invited me to come. Mm. And it was the first time I saw him perform. And also his group or his school came all the way to Burning Man from Japan. And I was really blown away, not just by the aesthetics of it, but his style is very tender and very caring. Ah. So I think that inspiration of the tenderness and the caringness that you see in my work comes from Kinoko. Okay. And you were, before this, a dominatrix. Would you say, how was your style as a dominatrix? Was it also tender? (laughs) Or has that developed (laughs) more when you started with Shibari? I I was a part of a group or a collective, and I was considered the sensual dom. What does (laughs) does it mean? uh, By comparison, that was like... The, the the like strict dom oh. you know or like the the sadist ah, yeah. i was the sensual dom ah yeah so it made <laughs> complete sense yes because you also said like which i which i really resonate with like that the the world is so harsh anyway there are so many like 
encounters that are like going to tell you off and you're going to feel like misplaced <laughs> anyway in the world. So then you're creating a welcoming or like a tender atmosphere. Is, is that what you always like? It's also a lot to, to discover that, mm -hmm. I guess. Because you, when I think about you as a kid, I feel you were like, oh, maybe even more like <laughs> hard. Was that a journey that you, uh, a discovery that you made throughout the years? Uh, I think it's more of an approach mm. that varies between working as a dominatrix and working as a shabari artist. Because when I was working as a dominatrix, the kind of person who's interested in hardcore BDSM is very different than a person who's interested in shabari. And I know some people who are into BDSM tend to be more on the scale of uh, sadism and masochism. Um, and someone who's into sh interested in Shibari, I think because Shibari is in the world of BDSM, the most aesthetic and the most beautiful of all of the different things you can do in that kink world. There's a lot of people who are interested in it who are not necessarily into BDSM. Mm. Um, and so I think that a more subtle and a more incremental approach and what i mean by that is you start off soft and small with people who are just curious about these things because you can always build up the next time you meet and you can always push the boundary but if you go really hard really fast you could shock someone or even traumatize them so if they're if someone's a newcomer into the world it's best if you start something tender and soft and go too hard yeah And there's this, like, such a mega trust to to be tied up. Mm -hmm. Did you, when you um, uh, got tied up yourself, did you ever feel like, no, I don't resonate with this person, I don't want to be tied by this person? Like, is that... <laughs> I mean, have I ever met a rigor that I didn't want to tie me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I'm just thinking because it's such a dynamic that you created. Too. It's very personal being tied up. You are completely like, you know. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but I spent a lot of my formative time doing shibari in Japan. So I would really love to go out and do some like what they call rope jams in Berlin that'd be amazing because I know that there's a lot of really great shibari artists here but I haven't had that opportunity because I kind of started during COVID and everything was shut down and only started to come to Berlin a, like a year or two ago yeah this is so crazy to me. to me <laughs> feels like you've been doing this for like 10 years but it's been like five five so crazy it feels like you've been uh, doing a lot in this very productive no Yeah, I got very obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have this mindset or was this just another thing that like, were you always finding something to obsess over or was this when it hit the bricks kind of? I'm always obsessing over something. I'm yeah. just this, <laughs> my kind of personality. <gasps> Before right. Shibari, uh, I was working, um, not working, I was a fencer. For like five years. A what? A national fencer. You know, fencer. like the swords and everything. <laughs> wow. All right. Yeah. And I just stopped because I had a sport injury, but I was very into that, yeah. which kind of has a link to Shibari because Shibari comes from a martial art. And I, know, I like the art of martial arts. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, but you've been already uh, hosting like really major events in like at least Europe and the US. I don't know if you're doing it in Asia yet, but not yet. I know you ha you know, like you've been studying it closely. So like, how would you say that the um, uh, practice differs in uh, Europe and the US and uh, Japan or Asia? I would say that the approach, when I was talking about how shibari is done in different ways, like either as a sh sexual practice or meditation or art, you can find these variants of shibari in all over the world. It's just that I, obviously in Japan, a lot of the shibari artists, they stick to tradition more. Mm. And I think there's more experimentation outside of Japan. 
I'm just thinking like, because it feels like there are so many like cultural differences too. And like how we face like that. I'm only thinking about intimacy, for example, or standing close to, to a person. It differs so much. I know in, in like uh, North Europe, it's very different from South of Europe in how like close we feel comfortable in standing with each other and you know, these things. So would you say it feels different depending on? I think the most notable thing that's different from Japanese culture approach to shibari than Western is their notion of honor and shame. And Mm. we don't have this so much in the West. And even in ways that they hold themselves and body language like there's a position it's like it's this you know how they sit in japan ah yeah and it's called saiza and if in japan one and of it's the f- with on the like how do you call that sitting like this saiza? for the people who just listen it's called saiza ah it's called saiza in all like that's just mm-hmm. the word <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> okay. So you start often shibari like this, and one of the first things to like break someone down is to push them out. Uh-huh. Uh huh. <laughs> so I think it's if you don't understand Japanese culture, it just looks like you're throwing someone off balance, but it symbolically means a bit more in Japan. And there's also some other things like if you were to expose, say, the tongue. That's mm. very shameful. Um, even in <laughs> um, in Japanese culture, when they were to expose like just a little bit of the shoulder, which you can with some of the, the rope ties, that would have been considered to be slutty or shameful. Yeah. Um, so I find like a lot of the rope is nuanced and based around, at least traditional shibari is based around these cultural differences mm. that you don't see so much in the West. Yeah. Unless they copy the traditional positions. Yeah. Ah, okay. But how come... So, like, okay, let's go back a little bit more because I feel like we're just running. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But, like, when you saw or, like, experienced Shibari and was there ever a moment where it clicked for you? Like, I need to learn everything about this or like I need to practice this that moment was at Burning Man Mm. when I saw those performances and I saw the the trust building and this beautiful act of vulnerability and the care of the rigor I was so enchanted by it and it was really this very powerful moment when I was thinking I need to do this and I, I don't know if you've been to Burning Man, but it, it's like a horseshoe um, shape. And they were outside the horseshoe shape at the end. And I would just oh. take my bike from the center of the horseshoe, like 25 minutes and just bike very passionately to go see each show every day. And at the end of the week, Kinoko came to me and he held my hand and said, I want you to come to Japan and be my student. And it felt very magical. Like it felt like the beginning of a story or something. And it was because now I'm his production manager in America and Europe and I'm his apprentice and <laughs> been working together for, oh my God, I think now it's four years or something. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and this person lives in the U.S.? He lives in Tokyo. Ah, he lives in Tokyo. Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. Because, okay, okay. And then you went to Tokyo to learn everything about it. Yeah. I, yeah. How, what, was there any, um, any, like, moments where you felt, like, um, doubting it? Or have you always felt like, I am, like, you know, you decided there that you are going to learn it. But did you decide there that you are like, you know, this is what I'm going to work with? What I'm going to work with? That I'm going to like, you know, like either you have like uh, something you you want to, you do it on your free time, but you are like living it and breathing it. Like, did you, did you envision oh. how you're going to? Uh, no, I went there just 
out of, I just wanted to learn something new. I was kind of in an emotional rut in New York. So I just decided, okay, I'm going to go to Japan for a few months and see what happens. Mm. And I went to study Shibari with Hajime Kinoko in his school called Ichinawa Kai. And at the end of the months I was there, he got an email from the Museum of Sex in New York saying that he, they wanted him to do a performance with a very big Iraqi exhibition they were doing. And he was like, do you think this is a good idea? It's a good museum. I was like, yes, it's an amazing museum. You know, the one on Fifth Avenue is really big and it has a great reputation. And so when we came to New York together, that was the first event that I helped him with. Mm. And then I met the um, the director of the museum and he had me work on a lot of other projects. Mm-hmm. And that's how I got into event production. Ah, okay. But there's also like, because uh, I, I know you've been mentioning that a lot of people are like more mainstream media have been asking you to maybe do like, do uh, Shibari more accessible for for people and like maybe create studios and these things. Um, can you, what, what would you say is the, um, you know, the importance of keeping the relation to BDS, the BDSM scene and like honoring that part of it? I think there's two parts to that. I think the first one is, that shibari is not just something that's pretty and aesthetic, it's very dangerous. And like many BDSM practices must be approached with a lot of care, not just for the person's body, but also for their mind. Mm. And so people who go into shibari just doing it, they, as an aesthetic practice, need to know that what they're doing could really hurt someone if they don't do it right. So there are a lot of really cool tutorials now that are popping up, but you can learn a bit online. But there's there's still some things like, for example, how you tie someone, um, how you create the tension of the tie and also learning about the different arteries and the nerves in the arms and being very careful about that because you can make someone faint or give them nerve damage. Uh, <laughs> yeah, then the, the, the scene's no fun. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah, it's true. There's like, you can even go just on YouTube. Yeah, maybe mm-hmm. that's the... Yeah, the backside of when things get popularized. Yeah, um, there's also like a t- so when you get tied up, you are very you're obviously very submissive, and you enter a uh, what's the name sub space, subspace exactly. Can you tell us a little bit about like how you can on like how the how the subconscious mind can work with like uh, because obviously you would if you if you would uh, feel like um, if you'd been through assault and these things you need to 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 take provide help on like there are a lot of alternatives and the most recommended one would maybe like seeking therapy but there are also other ways to like discover those spaces within yourself and like why am I triggered by this situation or like and like relive trauma and like deal with it how would you say that uh, entering a subspace where you feel completely safe could help one deal with that Uh, I think it's always good to preface that answer with it's really important that people do seek a licensed professional to talk about sexual trauma. But very, very often I've met a lot of people who love rope and have been tied by me that found a lot of catharsis in being tied. Mm. Um, And there's something undeniable, undeniable about that because this theme keeps coming up. And I think that's one of the most lovely things to hear is that you can create this safe container for someone to be reacquainted with their vulnerability and to feel them their body again. And especially when someone has been sexually traumatized, they fragment themselves and they dissociate from their body. 
And sometimes what happens is when they get triggered, they can kind of leave their body in a sense. Mm -hmm. Um, When you're tired, your senses are heightened and you can feel the 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 limits of your body and the rope and you have to breathe into the rope and be very mindful about how you're feeling in them and i think this kind of situation allows someone to be reacquainted with their body again and with a good rigor they can feel safe and they can feel good and that starts to imprint some positive memories about being intimate with a person again yeah i feel that you um your aesthetic is very like romantic in some way <laughs> like um and very also like um honoring the feminine side of it just like your your master uh, had the same approach um but do you think it's also a way to kind of like build trust I, I've always been interested in romance and beauty mm. I think I'm just a hopeless romantic <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just like I like romance, and I think that there's something kind of romantic about rope because, mm-hmm. as we've been talking about this theme, about rope is a tool of trust building, and without trust, you can't love someone. So there is something related. There's a link between trust building, vulnerability, and love, and I think. When people experience rope over and over again, they start to learn a bit more about how to build connections to people in yeah. a very strange alternative way. Yeah. And do you have like a way on how you connect with the people or like how do you, for example, if you're at an event, can you decide to, do you say rig? Yeah, rig. yeah, to rig uh, a person you haven't connected with before at that event, or is that a process that takes a little time for you? You mean the model that I tie in the performance or some of the audience? Yeah, members? exactly, anyone. Anyone? Yeah. Um, well, usually I know who I'm tying Yeah. because I would like that the performance goes smoothly and I know what their limits and boundaries are of their body, so I know what positions I can transition them into. But sometimes it's fun after the performance to pick some people who have never been tied or would like to be tied and to tie them in the perform after the performance. And usually mm. that's just based on instinct and, you know, chemistry. All right. So it's not you don't have a way of like how to create that trust with the person, but it's something you just feel. I usually when I before I tie someone, I always have a conversation about their boundaries. Yeah. Um, so with rope, what's really important is good communication. And I always ask what are their limits, their boundaries, if they have any injuries. And I always tell them if something is too uncomfortable, then we stop. I don't think there's any point in pushing someone too hard. Um, I think it's better to stop when someone needs to and then pick up again another time. And a lot of the people that I tie with, I've been tying with them for now three, four years. Mm-hmm. And there were things that they weren't able to do a few years ago that they can do now. Like different positions that they would have found very overwhelming. And now that they can relax into it because they trust their body and they trust me to do it. Mm. It also seems like it's a bit, it get it tends to get like an obsession like people who start they get like into it no 100 percent. there is definitely <laughs> some sort of obsession around rope yeah. yeah why is that do you think hey john marie smash we have now come to the part of the podcast where if you are or want to become a patreon and support the work that we do as well as get more juicy material, go to patreon.com slash playful magazine. And then in this extra material, we get a bit more comfy and delve into how one can get started, what one should look for, as well as look out for, what about it creates the obsession. And Marie shares many of the lessons she learned on her rope journey. Go to patreon.com slash playful magazine. 
I think there's the obsession around robe because it's con- making people confront themselves in a way that they haven't confronted themselves before. And I think that the confrontation is so visceral. Even if you were, say, like to go and talk to a friend or a psychologist about yourself, you have control about what you think and what you say. But when you get tied or when you tie someone, the emotions that come up in that session are sometimes uncontrollable and unexplainable. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by the the visceralness of it. It's just it just hits you. It's just it's impactful. And I think that powerfulness of the rope is what makes people obsessed because they want to know more and they want to be out of that control so that they can dig deeper into themselves. Okay. And do you think it's also like there's a release of endorphins also within this? I don't really know how that works. Maybe, you know, could explain a little bit more. Uh, Especially in suspension, when someone is suspended, their body goes into a stress mode. Mm -hmm. And then their body releases endorphins and the more transitions and the more intense the tie becomes, the more endorphins. And when you come down, you feel like you were on a cloud and it's a very central, very let go feeling, which is also very nice (laughs) to experience. Okay. So if you would describe the feelings, (laughs) maybe this is a weird question, but that from when starting to get tired up to being tied up to the release how would you describe the emotional roller coaster kind of <laughs> <laughs> uh there's definitely this moment of right before you ascend into air where you have to choose between panic and surrender okay because you are uncomfortable with the the being tied up you you mean or i think it hurts when you're suspended in air it's just very unnatural to be lifted in air without you choosing to be lifted. So oh, yeah. the, that's what I mean about like there's this visceral moment of I need to surrender now or I'm going to panic and it's going to be very uncomfortable. It's kind of like taking a psychedelic. There's a moment where you have to surrender to letting go and embracing the sensation of whatever substance you've taken or you just panic because you can't control the feeling of it. Mm-hmm. Rope is a lot like that. I have never been giving birth, but that's how I imagine giving birth is also. (laughs) Actually, no. (laughs) But like, just like, okay, this is going to happen. Yeah. All right. And then where does the endorphins come from? Where does it come from? Like, is that, uh, yeah. Like, is it because it's been hurting or like, how does that chemical part of that work? I think it's a mix of something psychological and physical. So your your body's being lifted by a rope. The ropes kind of bite in the skin and the gravity's pulling you down against the rope. Then your mind is like, this is not natural, even though I consented to it. Panic, what's going on? Like, I'm off balance. I'm upside down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's a mix of both. Okay. <laughs> How often do you get tied up now? Like, is it part of the... You know, is it, is it part of your weekly plan, planning to be like, okay, you know, I'm doing these events, but then I'm going to need some release myself. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you know, actually, I, I very much enjoy being tied up. Yeah. Um, and I don't get tied up very often, but when I do, I really appreciate each time because I feel like I'm also learning a lot about myself because all day I'm tying people and I'm allowing them to feel vulnerable and soft in these ropes. But then if you don't experience it yourself, you don't know just how impactful they are. And sometimes just having my wrist tied like this, I feel all these emotions that I didn't even know are there. And then later on for hours and thinking, why do I feel like that? Why am I not okay with that? Why? Like, it just makes me think a lot about myself. Could you give some examples of what you can realize? Uh, I think what I mean by what you can realize is just how comfortable you are with losing control of yourself and also trusting another person. I mean, also being able to like not grip life too hard. It's at least in my understanding, something that makes you more comfortable with the ease and the flow of life. So in the whole, you know, it reflects the whole somehow. 
Yes. <laughs> uh, I, it's a very philosophical way to put it, but I think that's one of the greatest things that I take away from practicing Shabari so long is that you can um, um, apply this concept of surrender to your life. And sometimes just l the, the process of being suspended or being tied is what I said about you feel this panic and then you let go, but then you're somewhere very beautiful when you're with a trusted person and it feels really great. And it's mm. kind of like life can be like that. You're going into this unknown place sometimes in your life and you don't know what's going to happen. You're panicking because you want to control everything you don't know. But if you just trust in yourself and have faith in life, sometimes it just turns out even better than you imagine. And I feel like having this kind of philosophy also helps the flow of life better. Yeah, I love that. This was it for Playful Podcast this week. But please follow, subscribe and listen to our next episode. And if you want to have a say about future artists or even ask your own question to one of our guests, follow us on Instagram and make sure to add your question when we lift our coming guests. Thank you so much for joining and see you next week.